won. The Hungry Jacks Grand Final Series 2018 continues. David Anderson, the 37-year-old veteran. Drew Mick to Creek and Ramon Moore on the charge. Shot for what sort of shot? Anderson, Prather, the seconds expire. Casey Prather and Melbourne United stay in the fight and deliver a big blow. Shorter gave it a good look. Deng makes sure he gets another look. And this time, it's all good. In hope that it finds Casey Prather. Hello everybody and welcome, it is NBL Rewind, hashtag NBL Rewind to get involved and you should have already, however you get your content at NBL, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, NBL TV, a grand final series that Liam, you and I have spoken a hell of a lot about, they finally, Melbourne United get the job done over Adelaide, five game series, but game three was huge for about a million different reasons, like there was a headbutt thrown into this game, which uh, always you know, right. really gets the interest up and about. But a man who was critical in the fourth quarter is the man who's about to join us. He's not even retired yet. He's just chilling to see what's going to fall out. But what a remarkable 20 years it has been. I'm excited, Liam. It's fair to say. Because we are all about the same genre as well. So you and I watch this guy, kill us in juniors, and then just travel around the world and kill everyone else. So hello yeah. to you, Liam. Yeah, no, nah, thanks, Cam. Great to have the big fella with us. One of the absolute all-time greats of Aussie mm. hoops and spent a little time in the NBL, <laughs> grabbed some silverware and uh, still doing his thing yeah. after all this time. So looking forward to it. David Anderson, DA. Hello to you, my man. Good day. How you doing, guys? I'm doing really well. So much going on. We're going to get into what a career it has been. But firstly, 2020, we always touch base. It's been crazy for so many. How has it been yep. for you and your fam? I mean, it's been good with the family and stuff, obviously, because uh, we've been in lockdown, so we spend a lot of time with each other. So, kind of great to reconnect, especially last few seasons being in Wollongong, a bit more stressful. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't say the corona's been a great thing. I mean, obviously, it's tough on a lot of people around here. And, uh, you know, it, it does help with the family time and all that. But, obviously, in the basketball world, it's not very friendly because uh, no one can really play or get amongst it or train or play. And it's... Uh, everyone's future's a bit up in the air. So, yeah, it's been a testing time, but obviously I'm seeing the positive in it. Hey, just, the, uh, that, just, just on that, Liam and I have been in lockdown, can't even get haircuts. We look like... That, <laughs> yeah, me either, you mate. So you cool, man. Hair? And you still look so cool, even though you uh, look like it's been a while since you had a trim. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. I've grown a long out, you know, it's uh, going with the Viking bun. So, um, it's been, yeah, it's been hard. Hard, it's testing. I mean, whoop. Lost my camera. Can't really do too much uh, in that sense. So I've been trimming my son's hair as well. But um, yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting times. It's cool like that. How's the uh, how's the farm going, mate? Restrictions are lifting, and you've been able to yes. get out there. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, obviously, I run a big business out there, so I've been uh, fortunate to be able to get out and and control that, and put a lot of energy into that because. Uh, Obviously, basketball world shut down. So, but um, yeah, that's been a big thing for me trying to get that business operating, and I've been doing good. So it's um, yeah, it's wet. Let's put it like that. It's been a wet season. And you've been uh, getting some shots up. Yes, I have. Unfortunately, you can't get down to local Frankston Stadium, where I'd like to be shooting hoops. But uh, fortunately, here I've got a little hoop set up outside, which I um get on with my little man Arlo and do some shots and uh, yeah, try and keep a little bit of touch in the times we can, but. Everyone tells me it's a bit like riding a bike and I feel like that. I go away from it for a couple of months and then I come back and it starts smacking three so it's no, no problem. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta say, DA, uh, we don't very, we very rarely have pre-production meetings for NBL Rewind, but with you, mm. we had to because there is a million different things we could have started at. We're gonna start <laughs> at Europe. We're gonna start at the Olympics. We're gonna start at the NBA. We're gonna start at the yeah. NBL. We started your career and where you currently are, and we ended up landing after flipping a coin on this grand final series just quickly. The game we just played. Uh, game no, that's three, fair enough. E evenly poised, one apiece. You go home for game three. And fourth yep. quarter, you come up with some huge buckets. As you look back, not just on this particular game, but the series that netted a championship at the end of it, what's your first yep. thought? Well, I mean, it was tough. And, you know, we had a couple of big games. I remember uh, game one was a real fight. And then uh, we came over the line and we went to Adelaide and... It was a tough one there. Obviously, we didn't get the win and we felt a bit robbed a bit by the rest, but I won't go into that. Um, but um, 
Yeah, we uh, came back to Melbourne and obviously you got the pressure on you because if you lose another one, then they've got the thing. And yeah, obviously screws tighten a bit. Everyone gets a bit clammy, but, you know, we went to fourth quarter. It was a bit of a close game, obviously, and uh, that's where I want to step up and shine a bit. So came out, actually helped out the team, put some big buckets on there. And, and uh, obviously, I think the rest of the, the team carried into the end. So it was... Um, yeah, it's one of those things. You want to help out and contribute as much as you can. And that year was, was a tough year, obviously, getting into it. So, but, um, yeah, the Adelaide series was tough. I mean, it went all the way to five games, as you guys know, and we came away as champions. But, um, yeah, definitely entertaining, I believe, for the fans. DA, we've heard from um, your teammates from that team and, and the coaching staff, Vico, about the, the impact that you had on that team. But it'd be interesting mm-hmm. to hear it from you. You know, like this is a Melbourne United franchise that had had some talented rosters for a number of years and hadn't been able to get it, you know, win finals and get it done. They bring Vico in. You're a big part yeah. of the Pete, the puzzle. What, what impact do you feel like you had on that group on and off the floor over the course of that championship campaign? Well, I mean, I still remember sitting down with uh, Larry and Vince before I signed, before Rio Olympics. And, and they were like, we know you like the talisman for, you know, winning championships and we won a championship here. So we're willing to obviously give you a deal and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, don't worry, Larry, I'll get you the chip. Don't worry, mate, we'll get it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, it took, obviously it took another season than, than expected. But, um, yeah, I feel like obviously in the team sport, a lot of it's culture and it's all of it's building and, and uh, obviously chemistry. You can have a very talented team and I've been on very talented teams where we didn't win and didn't reach expectations. So... That's uh, the big thing. And obviously, we did have a great team. We were very deep. We had a lot of good players, players that probably could have started and played more minutes on other teams. But we all clicked together really well. And there was a good, um, you know, belief in each other. I mean, we weren't all best mates off the floor or anything like that. But, you know, part of it is we were all pros and we went about jobs, you know, every night. And Vico did a good job of making sure everyone was held accountable and and doing their work. But, um, yeah, it just everything clicked really well, I thought, that year. And, And obviously... The championship was uh, was the outcome of it. How big was it for you personally? Of course, to, to win everywhere around the world, but to come here to the NBL and, and get that NBL championship, how big was it just from a personal perspective? Oh, it was, it was big. It's always in the back of my mind. Being overseas for many years, um, especially playing my trade in Europe, I suppose, you get a bit uh, flown under the radar a lot. So coming back home, it was a time when obviously the NBL was on the up as well. Uh, I feel like there was a lot more eyes on it. That's one of the reasons why I came back to Australia was to try and get the NBL moving in a better direction. And um, obviously, one of the big parts of that is winning a championship. So for me, it was uh, it was a key piece in my career. I've obviously won many chips along the way, but yeah, I thought it just uh, yeah it was the icing on the cake, I suppose. Let's let's take it back. Let's take it way back. Uh, you mentioned Frankston Stadium before, mate. The, the mayor of Frankston, the pride of the Frankston yeah. Bluesy good self. I That's remember battling it out with you in, in juniors. I can remember us Melbourne Tigers trying to get you to come across at some yeah, point. Yeah, true. Uh, there was a little bit of talk yeah. of that. Typical <laughs> Melbourne Tigers juniors. The Blues, yeah. <laughs> the Blues had you in that CBA program very early on. They, they'd worked out yeah. what to do. What... Take us back to those early days and, and your love for playing for... For the Blues the and that. Well, I mean, it all started out under 12s, actually. That's where I won my first championship, funnily enough. Under 12s, reserves, A for reserves, I think it was. And uh, we, um, we won the championship. I was obviously 11 or whatever. And my good mate, Dave Hankin, who I'm still good friends with, best man of the wedding and everything, he... Um, we had a great time. We obviously won the chip there and, and that was one of many to come. But yeah, with the Blues, obviously they did. They were instrumental. They got me into the ABA program or CBA back then it was called. And then um, we had a great team of, full of older veterans and stuff. And I remember the two American imports, uh, Troy Muhlenberg and Albert Springs. They used to, I used to roll with them to the trainings all the time. So I used to learn a lot. And Troy Muhlenberg actually taught me quite a lot. He was uh, after school two days a week i think the victorian intensive training you know program funded it that he'd work me out two times a week so he used to come to my school we'd work out for an hour then we'd go to the gym and do some weights and stuff and and then we'd go along to the uh men's basketball practice so it was a great steep learning curve for me but um 
it was great. It opened up the inside and how to be a pro or semi-pro because, uh, you know, Troy and Albert were just living over here doing their thing. And, um, yeah, I learned a lot in those years. And afterwards, obviously, it flowed on to the AIS. So just based on, on that, there's always times where it sort of clicks in your own mind that you can make a career out of a certain sport. And, and this, of course, being basketball, it, it sounds yeah. like pretty early on in your, uh, I don't know how old you were, 13, 14, uh, 15. Yeah, pretty early on, you thought this is going to happen or can happen. Well, I mean, no, to be honest with you, I didn't think I would be a pro. I mean, when yeah. I, I remember dealing with Troy and Albert, and they were talking about college. They obviously were uh, college players. They played their four years, got their scholarship, came over here, and they were semi-pro. So... I mean, it never really entered my mind to be a pro until probably last year at the AIS. I mean, I was thinking along those lines when even before I went to AIS, I was thinking more, oh, I could um, maybe get an education out of this, go to college in America, get an education. That was the next step of progress for me, I suppose, is the way I put it. And then afterwards, it came to my light that, oh, maybe I can go, you know, become a pro. So... It was, it was one of those things, you know, for me, I always say it was an evolution. I never thought when I was 10 or 11, mm -hmm. bang, I'm going to be a pro. I'm going to play for Australia. I'm going this. I've told many times to many interviewers, like, you know, if you told me this 20 years ago, I would have been like, you're crazy, man. Get out of here. In saying that, Liam, is it fair to say that the only person in the country who didn't think David Anderson was going to be a pro basketballer in 97 was Dave Anderson? We, we all knew. We all knew. That's why we were trying to, trying to get him to come across. Uh, you guys are too, too good. Yeah, you mentioned being at the AIS. We, can, we, we could see just before over your left shoulder a little picture there on the, uh, on the book. Oh, yeah. He's back. <laughs> we'll get you, you to take you. us through some of the memorabilia a little bit later. But take us yeah. back to being at the AIS – and the decision, like, okay, I'm going to turn pro. Um, you would have had some big college offers, no doubt. Who, who mm -hmm. what, what opportunities did you have in the States and, and which NBL teams were knocking on that door? So, I mean, in the States, I had a couple of big teams like UCLA were pursuing me, uh, Arizona with uh, Lou Olson, the late one. Um, so they were big ones. And I, I never actually ventured to the point where I went over and did visits or anything like that. But... Um, I did uh, obviously speak with some of the NBL teams then because they were obviously more keen than my parents. And, and I actually ended up settling on the Magic with Brian Gorgian back before that offseason. They merged with the Giants. So it actually, you know, it all turned around and was, it was an interesting, uh, obviously very quick learning curve about professional basketball then because I got squeezed out of the merger. And then I actually ended up going back to Wollongong, who were very interested in me at the start with Brendan Joyce and the Hawks. They were keen. They put a great offer on the table for me before that, but I decided to come home. But then, obviously, as things moved around, I uh, ended up back there for my first year as a pro. But, but in terms of college, it was pursued for me, but i got to admit, I wasn't much of an academic. I was very uh, rebellious in that sense. But in saying that, I've learned a lot over my years and, and probably a bit more smarter in that sense and hopefully influence my children that way. But um, no, it was, uh, it was a choice for me it was to be, be in Australia and start to be a pro, I suppose, is the way I thought about it. Just, just based on that magic situation, and then you touch on it, you learn pretty quickly a little bit about pro basketball. Do you reckon they change your perception or the way you went about certain things and have gone about it, you know, decisions or conversations or contract dealings with or whatever it might be over, yeah. the, over the next two decades? A little bit. I mean, obviously, you gotta you got to put things in perspective a bit. You can't get too emotional about it or anything like that. I mean, it was uh, it was a bit of a shock and, you know, kind of threw a spanner in the works. But, but you kind of realise that things work out in the long run and um, you've just got to make the most out of every opportunity. So, for me, it, it kind of, yeah, it threw me off. It meant I wasn't going to be at home. I was moving further away from home after living in the AIS for two and a half years. I was moving further to Wollongong, but I've got a great support. Like my family is very supportive. My brothers and sisters, obviously now my wife and kids and everything. But um, it's uh, it's one of those things. You just got to deal with your what what they throw at you. And and I felt I did a good job of you know just moving on with it and and finding the best opportunity, which was in Wollongong. Who'd they go with? Was it was it your uh, your was... mate from the state teams, Brad Sheridan? Uh, Rowdy was a part of it. Yep, he was already thing. But the bigs were, I think it was Wheeler and Pepper. Pepper came across from the Giants. Wheeler was already with the Magic. And I think there was obviously, I think, Rono, Ronaldson. I'm not sure. It's going back a bit. You're rattling my brains here with the memories. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, it was uh, an interesting. 
you make the move over to Europe, 18 years old to head over to, to Bologna. Yeah. Let me ask this before we get stuck into your, your career over in Europe. How big has your Danish heritage been for you and your basketball career? Well, it's helped a lot. I mean, obviously, my father's Danish. He's, uh, he came across, well, funny story, my mum and my dad, they're both European heritage. My mum's English, my father's Danish. They met in the middle of Australia at a roadhouse, which is pretty unheard of. And then uh, kicked it off and ended up going back to Europe, getting married and decided to return to Australia to settle down with the family. And obviously I'm one of five kids, so quite a big family. But yeah, and in Denmark, my father is one of 12 kids. So mm. I have over 100 and I think there's 145 cousins and, you know, second cousins, that kind of thing in in the northern parts of Denmark, in near Aalborg. And uh, I've been there quite a few times, obviously now a lot more than a lot of my brothers and sisters. But yeah, it was it came about obviously when the European Union came to fruition and took the oh, you know, and people were talking about it and how you can obviously do a lot more in Europe if you have a, a passport. So so we pursued that while I was at Wollongong with the help of my auntie who who's been like a, probably a second mum to me. And um, yeah, it came to fruition. I got the Danish passport. And when I was signed over in, in Italy, it helps you. You play like a local over there, essentially. And you have coverage for healthcare and all that kind of stuff. So it was a big part. And I'm proud to say that I'm Danish. And that was funny because the first thing, as soon as they saw that I petitioned for a passport and I talked about signing in Bologna, the Danish national team came a call and straight away and was like, oh, are you going to sign? Are you going to play with this? We need you. You know, we got, uh, we're trying to get to the European championships and all this. And I was like, uh, I've already played for Australia in the junior levels and everything. So I'm by national right, I'm Australian by basketball. So, which is probably better because obviously I wouldn't have seen any Olympics. I don't feel. <laughs> Thank goodness Denmark. for that. Yeah. yeah. And all Boomers fans are extremely happy. That was the, the situation that played out. Just, just, so just on that. So you're at Wollongong and, and you're going through the process you touch on. Uh, yeah. You talk about the fact of, you know, mentioned you're moving a little, you're in Canberra and now you're moving to Wollongong a little further away from Melbourne. Italy's a long way away. So <laughs> how does this all, how does this all work out? What is it, you know, is it, was it financially motivated? Was it the fact to try new things? Was it just the, the opportunity to play to, at a club like uh, the ones that were chasing Bologna? you? Bologna? Well, it's, it's all of the above, Cam. Yep. It's like, um, obviously, financially, they offered me, I believe, it was huge. It was like a $2 million deal for over four, four or five years back then, which was massive. And it was Kinder Bologna, which is, it was the premier team in Europe or EuroLeague even back then. So, so it was like, a, it was a huge opportunity. And um, obviously, me, I've been traveling with the junior teams quite a bit because I've been doing Albert Swartz tournament under 16s mm -hmm. when I was bottom age under 18s, top age, with the junior team. I traveled even during the Wollongong, my first year in Wollongong. It was, uh, so I was quite, you know, open to culture and stuff like that. So, but in saying that, moving to Italy is daunting to live professionally and be there in that scenario. So I was fortunate, like I said, my family is very supportive. My brother, Stuart, who uh, one year older than me, grew up playing basketball against him, obviously, and playing blues with him and everything. He, he said he'd, he'd come across and live with me, kind of like- I bet he did. <laughs> yeah, so the the team worked out a little salary for him. We we incorporated it into the contract. So, and uh, basically, yeah, I had very good agents. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> still, <laughs> still with the same agent as we speak. So yeah. Kenny Grant and Leon Rose, they were very good. They helped me out a lot. So so we got him a little bit of money to live with me, a monthly kind of thing. And then he just basically, it was a sounding board for me to talk to and and to work out with and and do things with. And obviously. Um, helped me adjust to the life over there. So it was um, it was an uh, interesting time. And, and obviously, he just, I suppose, acclimatized me a bit easier to, to the Italian way of life. I helped him out. Obviously, we went out. We had a lot of good funds together and good times. And um, yeah, obviously, I think that helped me a lot in my adjustments. What are your most treasured memories of those years in Bologna? You're winning Euro Leagues. You're... Oh. What an amazing way to start a, a career. It was, it was crazy. I mean, obviously, the first year I was there, it was a bit of um, a letdown, I suppose. It was a learning curve for me, and I was quite, I got a lot of opportunity. Um, but we had a stacked team. Everyone thought we were going to win the EuroLeague and be like better than anything. I mean, supporter cup. But 
we kind of disappointed a bit and the coach was obviously a bit testing times for that. But then the next year we actually got new ownership and they went another level. We got a younger team and uh, some real good pieces around it. And we ended up winning. That was the Kings Cup, they call it. The, the, um, we won the Italian League, the Euro League after the Italian League. The Italian Cup, you sorry, is the mid-season competition. Then we won the Euro League and then we won the Italian League. Yeah. So we won everything you could possibly win that year. And um, one of the craziest memories I have is when we won the EuroLeague, basically it was a five-game series because back then it was the first year of the EuroLeague and we went to, it was against Tower Victoria, which uh, they were one of the other premier teams from Spain. And we basically went all the way, five games. We'd lost the first one even, I think, and then two games. Then we won two in a row. Then we lost the uh, fourth one away, came back to Bologna for game five and ended up winning like, you know, it was a close game, eight points or something in the end. But the thing I remember most was literally the siren went and the crowd just rushed the floor. Like it was like a, it was like a riot almost. Like, you know, literally I was on the bench when the siren went and we all just ran for the locker room, passed the scores board into the locker room. And within like 30 seconds, they were up cutting the nets down. The fans were jumping on the rings. <laughs> Chants were going crazy. Flares were getting set off. And basically, like, within, I think it was about five minutes later, Marco Yarich walks in and um, one of the guards, he was on the floor when the siren went. He came back in literally in just his jock strap. He had, like, and his shoes on. They took his jersey off him, his shorts, everything. It was crazy. They were just going nuts and they were just chanting away. And we were in the locker room just celebrating and popping champagne and, and uh, going nuts. And they're just singing outside our windows because they're all, like, it's in case is a stadium. And they're just chanting all the songs and we're throwing out like socks through the windows and they're going nuts every time we give them a sock or something like that. And it was no real big, I don't believe, like a big ceremony. I think it took them ages to clear the floor so we could just get our like trophies and stuff. But um, huge game and we won in Bologna. So after the game, after it all settled down, we went downtown and, and the crowd, the people were just riding around on scooters, just beeping horns. And it was like New Year's Eve all over, firecrackers going off. Did this surprise you? Like, like I know once you've been over there for a couple of seasons, you, you see the the fanatical, passionate fans. Mm. But, it, but but when you first left the NBL and went over there, did you have any idea this is what it could be like? I mean, I knew I'd seen it a little bit, like, you know, playing national team a little bit, mm -hmm. but not to this level. I mean, Bologna was huge. There was a rivalry there that was like, you know, it's crazy. You got 42 to and King to Bologna. And they were like the two biggest budgets when I got to Europe. So that was like massive. We beat them in the semifinals to go to the finals that year. And um, it was, yeah, it was phenomenal. So the, you get used to that a bit. They used to chant at me. I think I've said this before. They used to call me Kangorino Di Merda at, at 42. So every time I catch the ball, they, you know, you had 6,000 fans just screaming, Kangorino Di Merda, va fanculo, which means like kangaroo, piece of shit kangaroo. Fuck you kind of thing. So I was like, you know, <laughs> thing but then you hit a jump shot and they all go quiet and that makes you feel good so it was it was nuts so you get used to you know they throw coins at you they 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 swear at you in greece they'll spit on you do everything you know so i'll kind of i'm pretty level-headed when i'm on the court and uh it never really got to me too much but but yeah some people get pushed back by it and get a bit of you know afraid of it but for me it was just gave me excitement so fair to say when you roll in the perth arena it doesn't matter what nbl jersey you got on and they're going booing you they, you don't care as long as you're yeah. not throwing missiles at you or, or, or ash or smoking in your face. Exactly. Not too bad. But I mean, in saying that, Perth do have a pretty hostile environment. There's always this one hecker in the background too that gets to, he just sits there just constantly handing, which is, which is interesting. I mean, you do it in Europe, they can't really understand them. But yeah, you, you got that bloke in you, it's kind of funny. But but no, nah, it's, it's, it's fun. And like, it's not the same hostile environment, I suppose, in Europe. Like in... In Europe, they're just, I mean, it's different nations too. So you don't know like the history of it. Like people might be coming yeah. to the game like thinking, oh, we're going to kill these Spanish team, you know, when you're playing Euroleague because they're Italians or German playing against Russia or this kind of thing. So it's, uh, I'm sure some of the fans get their, vent their anger out through the sports world. <laughs> and, tell, and us about, had... uh, tell us about a young man who Ah, oh, he was a freak. I mean... He was good. Like he came to us and he wasn't really known. Like, you know, he was playing in Reggio Calabria the season before and we beat them in the playoffs. But um, he performed out of this world in that playoff series. We went all the way to three games with them and was going back and forth. And 
But anyway, we beat him. And then that following season, he came across to us as a player. And, and he really, like, took off that off-season, I feel like. He came in and, and one of our stars, Sasha Danilovic, kind of was, you know, he was on the cusp of retiring and didn't really feel for it too much. And I think, you know, he saw Manu where he was and kind of just said, oh, well, you know, and I think something happened there. But but Manu was phenomenal. He just, you know, in training sessions, I just love playing against him. I love, hate playing against him too because – He'd come down the lane at you and he'd do this, you know, snaky sidestep around. And you'd be like, I've got him. I'm set up. I'm taking this charge. And he'd just snake around you and lay it up on the other side. And you'd be like, how the hell did he get around me? <laughs> and you'd be like, D-. and so by the end of the season, I just resorted to fouling him every time he came in the lane. I'd just take an arm off and be like, nah, go on the free throw line. But yeah, he was great to play with. Real humble guy too. Like you could have been, a, you know, been a bit of a a dick about things because he was killing the Euro League. He made the MVP mm. that year. Mm. He was scoring a lot in the Italian League. You know, he had huge things and he could have gone NBA, I believe, straight after that season, but he stayed for another year. But um, really good guy, just humble, went about his business, never like said anything like, oh, I need more shots. I never heard those words come out of his mouth. He just was uh, all about winning as well. And, and I think that's it's a bit in the Argentinian mentality, I feel too, because I played with another guy, Luis Scola, Another Argentine, same similar kind of mentality. So, it's um, it was great to be a part of that guy's career, and and then to see him doing it in the NBA, kind of made me feel better when I saw you doing those snaky kind of things, and I didn't have to be like, oh, it wasn't just me getting fooled. It was some you know of the what, best guys in the world. You know what they did over there? They just resorted to fouling him. Nah, <laughs> smart people, huh? <laughs> That's a scam. It, it sounds like you're almost the first DA to uh, be exposed to the Euro step, which is now obviously something that every player almost in all around the world has part of their repertoire. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, that's back then. It was, uh, it was a bit. Um, you were calling it trouble of practice. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I was. I was <laughs> asking for it, swearing at the assistant coaches. Come on, man, it's a travel, and they would never call it. <laughs> um, but nah, he was good. It was during this time with Bologna that you got drafted. Hmm. Um, that's correct. The NBA. Talk us through the the draft process. What do you remember about all of that? Well, I mean, I was so. I was always on the draft radar. I remember hearing about it, um, that I was high, pretty high up and blah, blah, blah. But obviously, I didn't get that high, obviously, is what I wanted to. But I played, obviously, I was 2002, I got drafted. So I was at 22, which is the eligible age you have to wait for. Um, well, that year, we didn't win the Euro League or anything, but the season went late. I remember it was a late off season. And then we, uh, obviously, I went across and I did some workouts over there with a couple of people in uh, Chicago, I worked out there I did in Orlando and a couple of things. And then it was off season. So I was, I was away. I was on holiday and stuff when I actually, the draft went on and I didn't know there was no expectation. I was going to go high either. Like, you know, no one was like, it's not like now or Bogues when he was went number one a few years later, but um, yeah, I didn't know what would happen. And, and funnily enough, I was just, uh, I was chilling. I was on holiday and I remember, watching it a little bit and being a bit disappointed when your number doesn't get called and then eventually got called in the second round uh to atlanta hawks and um yeah basically my agent called me and said yeah they've drafted you blah 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 you've still got contracts in europe um obviously you can pursue the nba if you want but you know everything happens in september october with the nba and uh your obviously your european seasons all start up in july august so he's like, you, you're going to have a con. It's going to be hard for you to, to to work something out. And if you're not getting anything guaranteed, he was kind of like, stay in Europe. You're earning good money. You're winning championships. You're maturing more over there. I think it's better. So, so for me, the NBA kind of went on the back burner a bit as I pursued more, you know, more glory in Europe, and I started to step up. Um, probably the biggest calling card was for Europe. Was uh, I mean, for the NBA, would have been after my. 2004 season with Siena. I uh, was the MVP of the C of the series of the final series. We won our first championship there, and then I I was thinking about making a move to the NBA, and they were talking about doing a trade and stuff like this, and it happened. But then, funnily enough, I got a huge offer from Seska Moscow that time round. So it was like, oh geez, what do you want to do? You want to hang out until September, give up all this money and this huge contract, go play for Seska Moscow, or do you sign and keep chasing chips and I was like well I'm going to be a pro and start chasing these so so that's why I got held put on hold a bit more was, was there a time as you continue to do exactly that dominate win championships 
and make pot loads of cash? Was there a time where you thought to yourself, the NBA won't happen? And you've made that decision. So was it like, you know, I may never play in the NBA? Yeah, it was a bit. I mean, I admit, like, you know, obviously, I never really, it never entered my mind that I was going to be an NBA player or star. Mm-hmm. But um, it did, obviously, when I was in Sesky, I was starting to win. and then, But then I went through an injury, a massive injury, and a lot of people thought I'd be done. That was career ending. But testament to all my support and everyone, my trainers and everyone, I got back on court and I was back playing at the top level. And then, um, yeah, there was, there was opportunities. But like I said, every off-season, I was given more by my teams in Europe. Like, you know, stay here, play here. We'll give you more money. We'll, we'll you chase this, you know? And it's kind of like, I'm not going to go for a minimum in Atlanta when I can earn a truckload more here. And it wasn't happening much. It wasn't much European influence as there is nowadays. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't huge. And then, um, so it wasn't until Barcelona when I moved out of Moscow, got to Barcelona and had a great season there as well. We went final four. I did great there. We won the championship in Spain. And then I was like at 28, 29 years old, I was like, nah, I feel like I've got a, I've, I've banked enough. I've set myself up. I'm really good. I'm in a good spot. I think it's time to make a trip. And luckily enough, my agents did a great job of working, mustering together a deal with Houston and uh, it worked out to a pretty good deal. So it wasn't too big a hit. Just, just, just- with the... Just sorry, just with the European yeah. stuff and and big money and new offers. Like, do you ever get surprised that a bigger offer comes? So you play so particularly well in some place, you win a championship, you're MVP, mm-hmm. and then an offer comes, and you pretty much do the same thing at a new club, and then another bigger offer comes. Do you ever sit back and go, I, I'm surprised that the bigger offers continue to come? Like, are they <laughs> way bigger? Like, I'm not no. saying like enough to Sometimes. make you change clubs. Yeah, no, sometimes, I mean, obviously Moscow was the top of the tier, I feel like. I did actually leave Moscow. They offered me a bigger deal, but I went to Barcelona, more of a, a lifestyle and, and, and um, change. And obviously it had been four years, hard years in Russia, obviously the cold and the weather wears on you, but sex do a great job of making you feel comfortable. And I, and I had a great time there and obviously won a lot. But then, um, yeah, so I moved to Barcelona uh, for a lifestyle thing and then yeah it is hard when you're getting the best of the best throwing you I mean you're talking about Moscow you're talking about Barcelona these great cities to live in as well so mm-hmm. and um, and you get treated like a superstar so it is hard but um, yeah it's one of those things you kind of rattles when I think back and I go to the cities I lived in very fortunate for sure this is this is part of the reason why you are the most underappreciated out and out absolute champion of Australian basketball because you're talking about your time playing for Seska Moscow, one of the biggest clubs in the entire world. Mm-hmm. And you say lines like, obviously, we won a lot. You won, you won Euro League, you won two Euro Leagues in those couple of those yeah. four years. You won domestic title and domestic yeah. cup after title after cup. Yeah. What, you didn't um, miss one. So, so underappreciated the amount of winning you did over the course of the career, but. Let's let's zero in on this time with with Moscow because all your league first team in your first season yep, there. That was first and then, year. And then those two Euro League titles in 06, 08. What are your overriding memories of playing for that massive club? Well, I mean, it was it's great. Like I said, they're probably one of the most professional clubs in Europe by far. And like they compared to an NBA team, I'll put it like that. Um, yeah, it's very not easy to play for me either because there's so much pressure to win. Like in my first year there, like I say, I was, I was EuroLeague All-Star 5, I think. And then um, we had the pressure of the Final Four was in Moscow that year. So they wanted to win it all real bad. And, and we didn't lose games. Like I think we went on the biggest pro streak ever. It was like 35 games leading up to Christmas or something like this. And we were just smashing teams left, right and centre. And, and it was great. You know, we we're having a ball. But... um then fast forward to the actual final four. We come to the final four was in Moscow and we lost in the semi-final to Tao Vitoria, who we'd beaten, I've beaten previously. And it was just, um, it was devastating. Obviously the whole team, the whole outlook, everything changed. Like that's talking about pressure in Europe. That's big time pressure. When you play for Moscow and there's a final four in your home city, it was like everything was on the line. And, and unfortunately it was one of those things we didn't get to play in. It was a different arena to what we played in all year. And um, we only trained on the floor once before the actual game and we didn't shoot well. 
guys didn't do what they normally do. Like it was Singh and then they were playing really well too. Like some of their guys had outstanding games. And it was just, it was one of those things. It was the compounding problem of every, every little thing that could have gone wrong went wrong. So it was like, God damn. And then, like I said, it was like a massive dark day in Russia for that. But then after that, we obviously ended up winning the Russian Cup that year and the Russian mm-hmm. League. But it was regarded as a black year. They, they just didn't want to forgive. So they changed up the coach. I mean, they changed up a lot of the players. They brought in Messina, who I've been with in Italy before. Mm. And then they brought in a couple of other players who I'd actually played with too. And um, yeah, the whole squad changed around. And then they, we ended up turning around the next year. We win everything. So so you get these sways and stuff like that. And it's it's hard, you know, with that team because obviously you lose a couple of games and everyone's on you pretty hard. But in saying that, that taught me a lot of, uh, I suppose, focus and commitment to, to winning and, and you start to build up good habits. And obviously winning is a habit. You've got to learn all the little intricate things and remain focused all the time because you can get carried away. You can party too much. You can do too many things. But we re- had a really good team. And obviously that next year we won. And then the next year we come back. We didn't win the final year league that following year in 07. But then 08, we win again. So it's... Um, yeah, fond memories from there. And obviously, I suppose Moscow is a its a crazy city to live in too. Like, it's its expensive as hell. Like, to put things in perspective, like, Cesc could get us an apartment. And there was two guys or two or three of my other teammates that lived in it. Previous teammate was there before I got there. And the rent on it was like over $20,000 US a month. So it is ridiculous. Like, it's expensive as hell. And obviously, you come there and you're like, what the hell? And the team's taking care of everything. They get you a driver. They're looking after you. You're living a different life. Like, it's nothing I've ever seen or never would have thought of coming from Frankston. And then you go there and it's, it's, it's crazy. So, and you're getting looked after. You go to the fancy restaurants. But it was funny. One of my friends, his American counterpart, who did a lot of dealings in, in Russia with the mining and stuff like that. He was from Duke University. And he said, it's like, the way he explains it to Americans, it's like, Miami, LA, New York all rolled into one. Yeah. And it's a, it's a bizarre world. I mean, it's very cold. That's what wears on you, the winter and all that. Russian people can be a bit standoffish until you get to know them. And then they're very open and very friendly. But um, yeah, Sesco as a team were uh, amazing for me. And, and obviously, I'm very grateful. And I hope to go back there one day in the near future and, and see him and obviously catch a game of theirs. Because I see I still follow them. They're winning Euroleagues. They're still doing mm-hmm. great things. But um, for me, the life there was uh, it was something to something to treasure, and there's a ton of stories I can tell. But obviously, we don't have too much time. We do. <laughs> we have plenty of time. We're, we're all uh, day. You- well, that's what I, I told these guys. I said this to a lot of journalists back in the day. I said, "You guys should have come over to Europe and visited me, or like on a paid thing from Basketball Australia or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know, and just spent a week, even at the Final Fours, because it was like it'll blow a lot of people's minds if they mm-hmm. saw." The, the things and the different lifestyle of the EuroLeague and the, and the, and the style you live in those cities. Well, these I, are I, the, the Stephen Howells and the Grantley Bernards of yeah, the world at this point. That's true, exactly. Hey, Liam and I spoke about this with, with Corey maybe two months ago now talking about your career. And I actually think, had social media been more prevalent, if we had Instagram and Twitter and Facebook <laughs> and whatever it might've been, when, when you were doing these things, you would be... Yeah. By the, by the neutral basketball <laughs> fans, you know, play, people like Liam and I who, who live and breathe it almost on a daily existence, we, yeah. we understand. But the neutral basketball fans, if social media had been 10 years earlier, you would yeah. be held exactly be where you deserve to be held in the minds of many. It's probably true. I mean, I'm not huge on the social media thing. I mean, it is hard. It's a different era, I suppose, for people nowadays. I mean, everything's so unprivatized. Everything's mm-hmm. in people's faces and you, you pretty much – thrown into the whole thing which is it's not a bad thing but it is obviously different type of uh type of confidence for me you know back then it was it was totally different so but i was fortunate enough i mean i know no social media and all that but when i talk to friends and i tell them stories and stuff and they get amazed by it and i was fortunate enough to share it with a lot of my family members they always flew over and, and visited me not so many in moscow because they were a bit scared but then as soon as I moved to Barcelona, bang, it was like there was a schedule of all my family members coming and visit me. <laughs> I was like, come on, like you didn't want to come to Moscow? Been, but in saying that, my parents and my wife obviously came and visited me and stuff like that. So it was, it's great to be able to share those uh, accomplishments and lifestyles with people close to you. So 
But it, it would have been good to show some journalists. It's well. a good point though, Cam, because yeah. the truth is it would have actually all been done for you. Dear. Yeah, like, agreed. We would have been able to just watch the highlight reels, the little packages instantly of what you did overnight. And like, for yeah. instance, um, like Alex Marich, all Euro yeah. League first team. He was killing like, it. People here don't appreciate how big time that is and how, right. how big he was because like you, he was doing it over there in what was kind of the darkness for us back here. Oh, he was huge. I was like, yeah, that's why I could not believe how much yeah, he didn't get nowhere near the love that he should have. He, he won champions. I remember him winning EuroLeague mm. with Panathinaikos and, and he got like, you know, not even a few few lines in the in the paper and stuff. I'm like, man, do people know he just won the freaking EuroLeague? Like that's the second best league in the world. I was over, up in arms with him. I was messaging him, telling him great job. And, you know, obviously we've been fortunate to to share trips with the Aussie team and stuff like that. Yeah. We talk about it. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure he still is obviously over the moon that he got to experience it all in person. But, mm. but yeah, like the journeys that he's done. And, and obviously now we've got some guys applying their trade, like Brock's over there doing his thing <laughs> and some others. But, you know, back then, like we had Matty Nielsen, me, mm -hmm. Truck, I mean, Alex Marich. So, you know, Brad Newley started to get on the scene too. Like mm -hmm. these guys, they all applied their trade and did a great job. And and that's what I kind of preach to the young guys now. There's a whole world of basketball in Europe which is untapped. And, and you know, you can make huge coin over there, be very successful, if, in the, if not as much in America as you can in Europe. So, so it's one of those things. There is a big world. And uh, obviously I was fortunate to be a part of it and the high level. Hey, DA, just, just on the domestic championships and of which you, you've won heaps, we talk more about EuroLeague than anything else. Mm -hmm. hey, just from, from, a, from a club perspective, from a player's perspective and from a fan's perspective, how, how highly are they celebrated? You mentioned before when you didn't win EuroLeague but you won the Russian Cup that it was still considered not a, not a great season by many. Yeah. The domestic grand finals and championships, how are they celebrated? Is it all geared towards qualifying for EuroLeague and winning that? Well, it was in the early days. So when I first got to Europe, uh, EuroLeague was obviously starting off then. And it was basically the top four teams, if I get it right, in Italy went to play in EuroLeague. Then the top four in Spain, top two in Greece, top Russian, top Israeli. Uh, I think there was one German team. Even one year there was an English team and a couple French maybe. But um, yeah, so it was all about if you won the domestic league, you would actually play EuroLeague or get to the semifinals. So there was a bit of pressure to do that. And in saying that, winning the domestic league, it's not bloody easy. Like, I mean, it's still oh, no, huge. Imagine. It's like winning the NBL. Like, yeah. put, you, put in perspective. But even on steroids, because it's <laughs> it's bigger teams, better budgets. So in saying that, Sesco always had the the thing. Like, we kind of winning there was not as big as when we won in Italy. So in Italy, but when we won in Italy, like it was huge. Like, you know, it was celebrations like EuroLeague again. So, I mean, yeah, the whole town's getting, thing. you're going to see the mayor of the city. They're giving you the keys to the city. You know, they're rolling out the sponsors of putting on 12 course dinners for you and stuff like this. I mean, it's, it's fun times. And, you know, to do it across various nations was, was quite uh, obviously great to experience the different things, but um. Yeah, some of them were, were pretty big, but yeah, huge. The other side, the Italian Cup, it's a mid-season comp. So for all the people who don't understand it, it's like you get the top eight teams or sometimes top seven plus a second division team. They come up, you go over a weekend, you play Thursday, Friday, and it's knockout. So top eight, eight teams, Thursday, Friday, and then usually Sunday afternoon is the final. So you bang, bang, bang. And it's like mid-season comp. There, There's a pause for a week or two of the domestic league and off you go. And for a lot of teams, it's like a, they call it consolation prize. So if you win that and then you don't win something else, then it kind of makes the season worthwhile, blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, we won. I've won a few of those. And it, it's not, granted, it's not huge, but I mean, it's still, it was great fun. And, and it's knocked out everything. And you, you have a big party at the end of it and you enjoy it and... Um, yeah, I remember in Italy one year, it was in Forli, which is south of Bologna, and we went to Milano Maritima as a team, which is on the coast of near Bologna, and, and the, they rented out a really nice restaurant, and we were all popping bottles of champagne. Because you know, you got to think, we're going back to work in four or five days' time mm -hmm. to chase a EuroLeague, so it's not like we get carried away. But, but if a lower-level team wins it, for them, it's like, yeah, it's like hallelujah, we saved the, saved the day kind of thing. So... 
But fortunately, yeah, we won a few of those as well. Just on that, and I think the NBL, we're going back to the 90s, had a mid, midweek cup or a midweek comp for a year. Yeah. Or two. Do you, might have been a similar th- format. Yeah, maybe not going into NBL 21 with uh, all the uncertainty, but down to like two, three years away when we're all back to some type of normality. Would you like to see that in the NBL? Would you like to see something yeah. mid-season trial, something like that? I think it's a good thing. I mean, it creates a bit of interest. And in, I mean, everyone loves a celebration. So, you know, True. if you can get something and like it creates a little pause in the season, I think they did it also a little around like having that pause and stuff like that. So, and um, yeah, it's a celebration. So, and you can incorporate, like I said, in some leagues, they incorporated the second division because the second yes. division in Europe is quite strong. It's a strong thing because you get the interchanging like footy, football in, or soccer in Europe. They have two teams go up, one team goes down, this kind of constant interchanging. So in second division, the teams are actually not too bad. So they one of the top teams played in the in the cup. So it was top seven teams plus a cup. So, you know, it was a good opportunity for those second division teams to bang, you know, chip off one a win a win against the top division team. So and I think it creates more excitement, something to build towards. I mean, because it, it gets a bit of a bit of a slug in the middle of the season because um you're playing so much and it's Europe and it's winter and, you know, it gets a bit of a grind. And then all of a sudden, come January, February, you've got this cup to look forward to. Mm. And for instance, in France, it's called the Leaders' Cup, which is all done at Disney World mm. up near Paris. So it wasn't the best. They put they construct this huge tent and you play on this floor and, and uh, you go in there and it's the same top 18 or 17 plus one. And um, it's done over a weekend. It's called Leaders' Cup. And you get a lot of, obviously, international, all the agents, all the, like, you know, su- you know the NBA agents are coming to look at all the talent that's there as well. And you get everyone in the same weekend in the same room. So it's quite a good uh, good way to bring everyone together. And, and it makes something to celebrate too. So we ended up, I won one of those with, uh, who was that with? Strasbourg or something I can't remember so yeah it was we yeah it's a great thing to be around and obviously have fun with it you mentioned the um the move to Barcelona and everyone coming over to visit um my man Tommy Greer tells a story about how or a bunch of stories about coming to visit you that that year it was it was the year before you went to the NBA um ACB champs got a bunch of great teammates Juan Carlos Navarro Fun team mm-hmm. to be a part of. Great. But he tells stories about you visiting you. You roll up to the club, you just park right out the front. He said you ran Barcelona. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Juan Carlos Navarro, he runs Barcelona. He's a man. He's a mayor of the place. Like that guy is like he he you need to do an interview with him one day if you can, because he was a man. Like for him to do what he did, and I, I ran on him because he was a great teammate too, real good guy. Um, he could score and do all the greats and and for him to stay in that club for as long as he did and win as much as he did uh, he was another guy who flew under the radar because of obviously different era and and stuff like that but you know one of the greats but no Barcelona was a great city and and like I said we did get a lot of visitors and Tommy was one of them he came over with a mate and um yeah I took him out for dinner we went out for dinner a couple of times him and my missus and stuff and and yeah we did go to the club and yeah probably did we get to get looked after we park out front and <laughs> walk in because they all know who you are your football club Barcelona so I mean right in saying that football players I don't even know they went out a little bit but they're so scrutinized that they couldn't probably let their hair down as much as we do as basketballers so yeah we'd be out a bit we had a youthful team and used to get amongst it but the the crazy thing in Spain and Barcelona we'd play the games at like 10 o'clock at night, yeah. 9 30 at night. So you finish up at 11 30, you go to dinner, you're not going to the club till 2 a.m. Right. And or 3 a.m. And no one's in there if you do go there earlier. So you just end up rocking. So the nights get dragged out pretty late. So I think we might have been 6 a.m. finished with Tommy that night. But, but um <laughs> good times. And Barcelona was great because it, it is a very international city and, and everyone loves it. And it's it was actually good weather as we got to the end of the season. But um yeah, there was very fond memories of that place. So did you did you change your body clock when you go to a place like that? Were you having siestas? Did you yeah. just like immerse yourself in whatever the culture was of the city <laughs> that you were in? I'm a very chameleon type person. I can yeah. blend into any culture, which is probably one of my reasons why I'm being successful is yeah. my ability to do that. But yeah, I, when I got to Italy, I was all about the siestas and, and everything. I mean, saying that growing up, we still had siestas at our house all the time, like when you could. 
skip class and have a little snooze and stuff like that. <laughs> but nah, we, um, yeah, Italy adjusted there. Spain, you adjusted your clock. You had to, because otherwise you, right. would, you wouldn't socialize or do anything. But no, I was very flexible. And, and yes, the Spanish ways of life were totally different. I mean, you think of Australia, you know, we eat dinner at six, seven o'clock, you know, these kind of things. In Spain, if you go to a restaurant at seven o'clock, like literally they look at you and go, uh, the chef is not in. He won't be in for two hours. You better turn around and get out of here. So that was a, is a different adjustment. But but I was fine. I used to adjust fine to it and the food saying that. So. Hey, DJ, just mention it just quickly. I don't think a lot of people realise, but the football club, the basketball club, it's all one club in yes. Europe, isn't it? Like people, I don't think yeah. a lot of people realise that. So you, you roll in, yeah. they say Barcelona, <laughs> And you've got, oh, yep. there's the football crew over there doing their thing, the women's football, our basketball. It, it, it's all one big club, isn't it? It is definitely like football club Barcelona. So the big stadium, Camp No, is where we played our games too. So we have our basketball stadium, which we shared with um, handball and I think it was volleyball and some other. So, and then Camp No, where they played the football games, is right there, literally attached. So, so we were all involved. I mean, we didn't really socialized too much with the soccer team or anything like that but there was a couple of times we flew back on the planes with them from madrid we had a cup in madrid and they were playing real madrid and a uh, huge game and then they were on their private plane which was huge like their plane was like a big 747 we flew back into barcelona and they gave us some seats at the back <laughs> of the plane because uh messi and that were all up front but but they were all really cool actually when you meet them like you know they're these huge profiles and and everyone's a bit daunted by him. But then you go up, you meet him, you know, you shake, you know, shook Messi's hand and said hello. And, you know, he's just a tiny little fella too. But, you know, this is when they're great. And a couple of their guys are good. They, they have a good sense of humour. Piquet, I remember him just getting the microphone and doing some singing on the flame back and stuff like that. So it's, it's fun to be around the uh, different codes of sport, I suppose, and see how they act and stuff. Because they're usually really good people. It's fair to say that you and Messi probably never hit the gym together. Is that that, that true? No, nah, not he's similar, like a guy yeah. like me. Jim's not something he looks big on. Nah, he's probably not. But he's insane. He probably does do a bit. He's, he's he certainly doing his footwork drills and <laughs> yeah, stuff like true. that. He's damn, he's fast. So, yeah. <laughs> but no, nah, it, it was good yeah, times. Yeah, um, it was. You lost me, my there. Yeah, you got yeah, me? we got you. Yeah. yeah, the um, it was at this point you made the move. To the NBA, Daryl Morey and yeah. the Rockets took less money to hit. You're playing for Cisco, you're winning Euro Leagues, you're playing for Barcelona. Why? Why? How did they convince you to make that move? Why did you make that move at that point? Well, like I said previously, like I, I was comfortable financially. Obviously, I've, I've been quite astute with my money. I've obviously testament to my parents upbringing. They were very uh, astute with the money and told me invest it all, don't blow it like other basketballs and buy all these. Porsches and, 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 you know, spend all the money on the flancy things, invest it all, get in the property, do the right thing. And, and I did that. So I was comfortable, especially once I got to Barcelona. I was like, nah, it's all right. And they did offer me more money to go back the following year because I had a great year. I remember seeing the general manager coming out of the concert in June and there'd already been talk about what I was going to do. And he was like, oh, we want you back. You know, we want you back. We're going to win your league next year because we went to Final Four, but we didn't win. We're going to win your league next year. We've got a bigger budget. We're going to give a thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Talk to my agent. We'll see, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out it didn't eventuate. But my agents did a good job in getting a, a three-year deal with Houston Rockets. And, and I was like, my mentally, I was like, if I don't go now, I'm 29, uh, I don't think I'll ever go. And I was like, it was always in my mind. I always I remember back to when I was young. I wrote down on my you know, wardrobe when I was a young fella. I'll, one day I'll play in the NBA in big stacks texture on the thing and and you know that always stuck with me and i can still see it in my mind when i think about it and i go i've got to give it a shot i'm comfortable financially i've won ample amounts of championships over here let's go give it a shot and and so when the opportunity came i was like yep let's do it and uh yeah the rest was history i jumped on board with houston and uh it was kind of like helping out because uh yao ming obviously had an injury that year and so it was all go then it was a different different tact and you know seeing the nba was you know, it's a different world how did the um the game on the floor the the style of playing the nba the style of playing in europe how did you find the adjustment and which did you feel was suiting you better 
Well, to be honest, probably European style was more suited to my game. I mean, NBA style is very, I suppose, more athletic and more um, less tactics, more individualized, you know, playing a lot more thing. And then when someone gets hot, they keep going there. Whereas Europe, they're, they're very strategy, you know, kind of based. And because you have such, you know, deeper rosters, there's a bit more weight in the ball too, I call it. Like, you know, if you miss a shot, you know, in the NBA, you miss one, you keep shooting. That's a good shot. Keep shooting. Bang, bang, bang. You, even you go like, you know, one of 10 or something. They're like, nah, that's a good shot. Keep shooting. Whereas in Europe, you go one of three, one of four, then the coach is like, nah, you're putting that away. You're not thinking, otherwise you're coming out. Mm. So there's a lot more weight on the ball, which I didn't mind because I, I thrive in pressure situations a bit. And when the game's online, probably for me, it's, it's a big, I like big games. So in that sense, America was a different different tact so you kind of had to adjust to it and bigger bodies more athletic harder style but you know I felt like I could have adjusted better and obviously funny as it turns out like big guys stretch fours and stretch fives are all the yeah. all the buzz now so I was probably 10 years ahead of my time to to play NBA but because we had bigger bodies back then which were like shacks and stuff like that yeah. so it was a different different tact but but I felt I adjusted pretty well and I did pretty good job in houston but obviously um yeah it was things it was a different style of play did you enjoy it oh like, immensely everything everything you dreamt of when you and you're writing things on your wardrobe is it everything you thought it would be yeah i mean it was it was different i mean the so in europe it's a bit more of a dictatorship, i suppose like they you go on the road you've got a eat with the team you've got to be at the shoot around you've got this meeting here you've got to do that everything's done with the team in, you know, without regard. And if you're not, you get reprimanded pretty harshly. America, it's all individual. Like your players go eat by themselves or with a little clue, you know, everything's done individually. Like you, it's all on the, you're like a true pro, I call it. You gotta, you gotta do everything yourself. You eat your own food. You choose where you want to eat, and what you want to do. And, and obviously you just got to rock up to the game pretty much and, and be ready. You can go out at night before a game if you want. You can do whatever you want, you know, day of the game. So it was very different in that sense culturally, but but for me it was good. I had some great teammates in Houston as well. Like I had Louis Scola, who was a European pedigree. I mean Argentinian, but he played in Europe for most of his career. And then Shane Batty was great for me, acclimatizing. I remember Chase; he was a rookie, Chase Buttinger, and we used to always hang out on the road trips and stuff like that. So it was fun, and it's the hype of the NBA is 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 crazy. Like everyone's. You know, every game's pretty much sellouts and, and everyone loves it. It's a big spectacle. You know, you've got the high-flying dunks and all that kind of stuff. It's, and it is good, even when you're on the bench, like you've got the best seat in the crowd. So you can watch them going at it firsthand. And you see the superstars, obviously, when you're playing, you forget who they are and you just go at them. But when you put it in perspective, you're like, oh, yeah, these are the, the big-time ones that you've looked up to all your life. So it is. it does live up to the hype. And uh, it's fun. It's a fun league to be around. Did you have a moment where you had that NBA logo on your chest and you reflected back to, to those dreams as a little kid? Like you're, he, you're 28, 29. You've had an amazing career already, winning Euro Leagues. You're already yeah. a two-time Olympian. But did you have a moment where you sort of spoke to your younger self and said, I did it? <laughs> yeah, there's still moments, but in my... Defend, like I did, I had a lot of those moments and and, uh, and I'm very fortunate, like a lot of the times I'll be sitting around with family members and going over the accolades and thinking about it and I go, shit, yeah, this is during it. So I'm going, yeah, but I've always been one of those people who just grabs at opportunities and tries to seize the moment and keep going, you know, never be shy to raise the bar a bit more. So, yeah. which is probably like some would say an illness because you're never going to feel like you're happy. But no, I always had moments where I sat still and went, yeah, no, it's been good and great. And, and a lot of those moments did come along too when I faced like career ending injuries, I'd be like, oh shit, like, you know, this could be the end. You know, I broke my ankle in Russia mm. and I thought that was the end. I thought I'm ruptured my knee at the same time. That was a horrific injury in Real Madrid. But, and those are the times when you kind of look back in the retrospect and go, oh, shit, no. in hindsight, you go, well, you've done well, Dave. You know, don't be sad because of this. You still, you know, you've achieved a lot. But, yeah, in the NBA, there was a couple of moments you, you sit down and you go, yeah, geez, we're, we're going at it, like playing in LA. And, you know, you're like, oh, geez, here we go. And then 
winning a game in LA. That's one of my big ones. I remember beating the Lakers in LA and I had a huge game, with like 17 points and I bought some. And I was like, it was great. You know, we got the victory. It was one of the big ones for Houston, for the Rockets at the time. And, and I remember Trevor Reza, who was with the Lakers before, he ended up hosting a little party bus and we went out and had fun. And it was a big time. It was one of those moments then you go, well, geez, like, yeah, this is, you go like, oh, this is what it was all about. All those countless times you're working out in the middle of the night or doing things like crazy times and suffering through workouts and stuff like that. A party bus. Yes. Explain that. <laughs> Take us on to the it's Trevor like Ariza party, party bus. Party bus. It's like 20. Yeah, yeah. But take, I know what a, Cam and I know what a party bus yeah, is. Yeah, I know. But I, take us on to the Trevor yeah. Ariza party bus after you've just beaten the Lakers. And also, yeah, I like I like the idea that Trevor Ariza, after he won the game, was just like, let's just get a party bus and there's a bus just waiting for you there. I, I well, like that idea. He's big well. time. He's big <laughs> yeah, time. True. He was big time. I mean, very good teammate. Like, great mm-hmm. guy. So he... um. Yeah, it was just one of those things. He was coming back. So it wasn't like – it was after the game. We think we played kind of early because you play earlier in, in America too because yep. everything shuts earlier. So mm-hmm. so it was just after the game. We all got back to the hotel and Trev was like, you sent out a, a chat to everyone, a message to everyone. If you want to come, you know, we'll go to the restaurant and then we'll, I've got a bus so we don't have to worry about, you know, driving or getting taxis, things like that. And then we'll go to the clubs after it. And so it was cool. It was like, oh, right, shit, I'm in. <laughs> I was a young fella. And like, even most of this team came and everyone was there. So it was great to celebrate the game and then, you know, just have some fun and, and go out and get amongst it. So, but yeah, like a normal kind of thing like people would do probably for bachelor parties, things like that kind of yeah. thing. But but Trevor just scrounged on up out of nowhere. Yeah, well, uh, I guess the, he's, he's got the connections and stuff out there. See, see that's the thing. You're right. Bachelor parties, bark hands in. That, 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 that. That's like six months of preparation that goes into these things. Yeah, true. <laughs> Not the old, oh, we just beat the Lakers. Uh, yeah. I got this 40 seater. Let's do this. Love yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> that's, love how it. They, that's how they roll butt out there. So, yeah. The Dave, boys are... a, few, a few years ago, I wrote, um, I wrote something about like the, the 10 best NBA games by, by Australians. Now, yeah. to be honest, most of them have been blown out of the water in the last couple of years by yeah, Bob Ben and Joe and yeah. Patty and those yeah. guys have been, and Bainsey. Um, it's a different era now. Like it's it's great and it's awesome for Australian basketball. I wrote about one night of yours for the Rockets against the Jazz. I think eight, oh, eight yeah. seven, three of three yeah. from long range. Do you was that Man, where does that one was think, that your best NBA game, do you think? Yeah, I believe I think that was in Houston that mm. that game, if I remember right. No, I mean, yeah, that was a formidable team back then too. Like the Jazz were good. So and we got a big win. And obviously, yeah, when you come out and you're hitting because it's a deep three-point line too. So for me, it was an adjustment learning how to shoot the NBA three from Europe. Like Europe, this is going back a bit too, so it was even closer. It was a, it was an adjustment. So you know, yeah, had a couple of big threes and and came out with a big game. And obviously, for me, yeah, you remember those ones. And and it's like that's when you feel like you belong a bit, I suppose. Once you have one of those games. But the sad thing is. A lot of those times you play those massive games and the next day or that same night, you might be jumping on a plane and flying off to the next town for another game. So it was kind of like there's a big difference. You talk about difference between Europe and, and America. Like, you know, in Europe, you, you beat like a big team. Like with Seska, we go play Barcelona and we beat them in Barcelona. You could breathe and enjoy it for like a week or even two weeks or something like mm-hmm. that. In America, you beat the Jazz, and then next thing you're on a plane, you're going out to play Chicago or LA or something. It's like you just got to reset your brain and get back to normal because you can't get carried away because it's the mm. same thing back over, mm. which is different. Whereas in, yeah, I remember Europe, we'd win big games and it'd be like, you know, you can party, you can enjoy it, you can, you know, you got to train and you got to play your domestic leagues and stuff like that. But yeah, America is just boom. It's like just a rhythm. You got to be emotionally stable and just keep ticking away. Mm. So, yeah, no, good uh, this, this kind of gives a bit of a sense of how much you've done because we're over an hour into this thing and we <laughs> haven't even got to the Olympics. Yeah, I didn't know. Yet. How long are we supposed to go? <laughs> Mate, I'm, I'm, there's, a, there's a couple of points we've got to get to first, but we are oh, almost going to wrap it up. Let's yeah, Four Olympic true. Games. Anytime you, you slide on a Boomers jersey, of course, it means so much, but the Olympics is, yeah. is where it's at, mate. Your memories of, of, of those four Olympics. Oh, they're great. I mean, every single one has its own, like, merits and, and great times and... And fun. I mean, yes, yeah, I suppose, obviously, your first one, you remember a lot because it's the first time around. So, you you know, you're getting your feet wet and you're getting into it. So, Athens was amazing. Like, you know, just seeing it all, absorbing it. 
Greece, Athens was a bit of shambles. I mean, they weren't the best at organizing <laughs> in any sense. But um, yeah, and obviously from the basketball point of view, it probably we didn't do as well as what we hoped to do. We had a, a tough loss and uh, that kind of set us up badly. But I mean, yeah, for me, it was just getting in, putting on the Aussie jersey was always proud moments for me. I mean, I remember going back to juniors, playing Schweitzer Thomas, green and gold. I remember going 99, junior worlds, everything, Japan, junior, whatever, to under 22s and 21. And then obviously going to Athens. And a lot of these seasons, a lot of people don't understand. Like they all say, oh, you got to put your jersey on. It's pride of the country and stuff like that. But for a lot of guys, especially ones playing in Europe, you got these long seasons when you win. We finish up June 23rd or something like that. And you got a national team knocking on your door straight away, like saying, oh, come and join us. we got a camp here. And I'm like, bro, we just finished the season. We just won the season. Like, I mean, give me some time to celebrate, get my stuff together and come back to Australia. So, and Athens was one of those years because we won with Siena and um, the national team were already going. So they were like, you know, and Gorgian was a coach. Luckily, he had some guys like Shane Hill who told Gorge, listen, Dave's pretty good. You know, he's obviously won a championship as his MVP of the finals. I think we probably need to make an exception here and, and bring him on board. And I've been with him previously in the year before qualifying. And then, um, yeah, so I met up with the team in Europe before the actual everything started. So it was like this, the sacrifice you give of your body and everything like to be a part of the Olympics is quite, you know, hard and everything like that. But, but it's definitely something I treasured. Athens was probably the one, obviously, the first time around. But in saying that, London was very special in its own right because uh, well organized and probably one of the most uh, probably enjoyable Olympic experiences because we had this uh, like a shopping center next door so your family could come and we could meet up there and it was quite good to share with the close people close to you and everything like that. Um, but Rio obviously coming that close to a medal it was heartbreaking and, and I'm sure you guys saw all the interviews and everything that went around it. And we were so dedicated and so focused on it with the culture, everything was on point and, and to come that close was real heartbreaking, but you know, it was, uh, it was a great journey with those guys, those comrades that we played with. It was um, fun, but, but yeah, green and gold is definitely a thing that sticks out and probably opportunities along my professional career came about because of what I did with national teams, which is obviously I'm grateful for. What um, what 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 are your top three boomers wins of your career? What's the podium? Oof, yeah, you put me on the spot here a bit. I mean, probably not not necessarily the best, but your favourite. Yeah, I mean, obviously you want to remember some of the good time. Obviously, uh, going starting from the closest boomers wins probably. Um, in Rio, I would say probably beating France because I remember Tony Parker was the boss of our team at that time. <laughs> I was playing with Asbel and there was a couple of teammates who were also on that team. So I had a bet with him and, and uh, that was a big win for us because it set mm -hmm. us up quite well in, that, in the whole qualification thing. So that was a high one and I played pretty well against that. And so that was good times. Um, probably some of the... Even the qual like the one in Melbourne, I believe I remember yeah. the qualifier, and, and it was it was a tough game because Bogues went down so mm -hmm. with a bad back, and I stepped up, and you know, and I can still be reprimanded by it because I put a few up, and Dre was felt like I was forcing it a bit and wasn't performing when I came on in the first half, and reprimanded me a little bit in the locker room, but you know, and, and the pressure was on because if we lost, we got mm. to go to New Zealand. It was it was like it was all on the line in front of a sold out. I think it was Rod Laver arena. Mm -hmm. So it was tough. But then I came in second half and, and started killing it and ended up like level top score with Batty. And, and we obviously beat them. And then we went and it was a great victory. And it was in Melbourne in front of home fans. And I had like, geez, I remember trying to organize the tickets for all my friends that day. It was like a hundred of them. And, and it was just <laughs> a night. It was a bit of a nightmare. But, but yeah, that was a huge one. That sticks out a little bit in my mind. God, I'm trying to think of other ones. So, yeah. There'd be a lot. I've just got to like rack the brain for a while. <laughs> you know what? We'll leave it at two because we are, we know there are a lot. We know there are a yeah. lot. There's a lot. I mean, I'm trying to think Beijing. Yeah. yeah no. Nothing's really sticking out in my mind. I've got to yeah, think about. Hey, uh, you're not retired. 
Mm. No, so, not yet. Twenty twenty's been <laughs> nothing. You mentioned it earlier in limbo, but like, where where are you? Are you conversations? Is there discussions? Is there possibilities? Where is it when it comes to uh, the future? Uh, not too much. I mean, obviously, when Gorge was in charge of Hawks for a bit, I was a bit of chat around that. Um, I was working out here with them, but then they've since then I think they've fooled the roster and everything. And then this whole coronavirus is throwing everything in limbo. So, and to be honest, like thinking about it, like the way the scenarios might play out, what might happen with the NBL, I'm not sure. Like, you know, it's different steps in your life. Obviously, as you get older, things take priorities and stuff like that. But, but for me at the moment, it's just about ticking the body over in doing what we can when we're obviously locked down and, and keeping everything, you know, just body kind of in a decent shape. And I'm, I'm actually might be starting doing a little bit of workouts with the Phoenix coming up because uh, good mate Simon, he's a coach over there. He said you can come over and, and get tick your body over if you want, you know, see what, you know, you never know opportunities might pop up. So for me, I'm not, you know, crying about if I don't, I'm not worried if I do, you know, it's more about just ticking along and, and kind of enjoying. I want to be involved in the basketball game a lot, you know, as with any kind of role, whether that's with the national team, whether it's with an NBL team or with the NBL as an ambassador kind of thing like that. I mean, I want to keep promoting the sport. I feel like basketball in Australia has really taken off from when I came back to Australia in 16. And we're getting great amounts of fans. Everyone talks about it a lot more. We're getting more media coverage, thanks to obviously you guys as well. Um, and it's just, it's going to a whole new level. And, and Larry has done a great job and I always applaud him and I mention him many times because for what he's done in the NBL, I remember going through all the, the crap and all through the, the mud, I suppose is the way I put it. And now it's come back out and we're hopefully I'm looking forward to it bouncing back. So I will be involved. I'm not sure what capacity yet. Good. But for me, as in playing wise, I'll be around. Hopefully you never know. I can still, still uh, ride the bike. But like they say, it's just like getting back on the bike. So for me, I will see what happens, but um, yeah, it's just a matter of waiting to see what, Opportunities knock as always. I'm going to say it right now, Cam. DA yeah. is going to be a game changing mid season signing by someone as an injury replacement. We know the man is a championship waiting yep. to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's going to be ready to. Uh, now, I see this is what happens, DA. He gets excited about something, kicks his microphone out. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a constant thing. That's he, all right. It's, it's, it's a the perfect, this is a perfect point. That's Someone's going to go down. Someone's yep. got to he's going to come in. He's going to have big minutes in the fourth quarter of a grand final series game. I'm calling it right now. <laughs> yep. Liam's oh. great for him. He's great for my mental state right now. He's making <laughs> me feel good. So. Hey, yeah, hey, whatever it. happens, mate, it has been an absolute pleasure watching you. As much as a pleasure to chat to you today, mate. And, and good luck for the future, whatever it might be, mate. We'll see you soon. No worries, Cam. Good stuff. David Anderson, superstar. Hashtag NBL Rewind. If you haven't watched the game yet, make sure you check it out. Get involved. What a time. Liam Sandemarie, I will see you next week on NBL Overtime. I'll see you.